But think about the water cycle. If you go and you look up in an encyclopedia or Google or whatever, the, the internet's going to tell you or an encyclopedia is going to tell you that the water cycle was discovered in the 1400s or the 1500s, somewhere around that time. Okay, by water cycle I mean the, you know, that the rivers flow into the ocean and then it evaporates into the clouds and then it rains either on the fields or up in the mountains and then it repeats again, right? Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 if you're there and look at verse number 7. And the Bible says in verse number 7, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Sounds like Solomon, or God, told Solomon how the water cycle worked. And we can get even more specific if you go to the book of Job. Open your Bible right in the center, in the book of Psalm, and go to the one book back and you'll be in the book of Job. Look at Job 36. Job 36. Job 36 and verse 27, the Bible says, For he maketh small the drops of water, they pour down rain according to the vapor thereof. The vapor is the, is the evaporation of the water into the clouds, which the clouds do drop, and look at this word, distill upon man abundantly. You know what distill means? Distill means purify. So God is telling you here that, first of all, the Bible documented the, the water cycle. God created the water cycle, period. You know, when you look at um, water treatment plants are a real big deal as well in California, treating water, you know, taking the water that's been used and cleaning it up. Guess what um, two of the main um, ways they purify water and water, commercial water treatment plants, gravel filtration and UV light disinfection. Well, guess what the rivers in the mountains do? That's God's gravel filter. And the rivers are shallow when you get to the top of the mountains. They're shallow and they're clear. Who knows what I'm talking about? They're shallow and they're clear so that UV light can shine right through there and disinfect and kill any microorganisms that's in the, that's in the water. So by the time it gets down to you in the valley, it's clean. So that cycle just repeats itself again and again and again. Now, I have an object lesson here. I love water. I love talking about water. I could talk about water for several hours too. I need something to hold this here. So, this glass of water, did you know that this is probably the most amazing substance on the planet? 60% of your body is made of water. If you go three or four days without water, you'll die. It's, you, you need it that, that badly. The one thing about water that I like the most is that water, this liquid right here, has the highest, what we call, specific heat on the planet of any liquid. Meaning that that water can hold heat better than any other liquid that we can make. Now think about this for a second. How many of you have seen all the refineries that you drive by and all the chemical plants? Do you know the amazing materials that man can make? We can make Kevlar, we can make nanotube fibers, we can make all these um, refined chemicals that can do all these amazing things. Yet, if we want to create a liquid, we can't create a liquid that can hold thermal energy better than that glass of water. Anything that I add to that water makes its ability to hold thermal energy worse. No one can, did you know that 95% of your electricity because of this fact is created using water as the working fluid. That's why. I have a book at home, it's called Steam, and it's all about adding heat to water. That's what the book is. The book is 1,200 pages long. It's in its 50th edition. You know what that means? That means that we still don't understand that glass of water. It's in its 50th revision. We still don't understand what that liquid can do completely. All the graphs and the calculations and all this, we're still revising that book. I don't understand all that book. No one, under, no one person understands that, that book even as it's written. When you go out soul winning on Saturday, it's gonna be hot. 
right? Because of this water's ability to hold heat, you're going to sweat. And then when the wind comes up, all of a sudden you're going to feel cool. You know why that is? Because that water that beat it up on your arm, as it evaporates, it's taking that heat away from you. It's pulling that heat off your body, and it's cooling your body. Who designed that? I mean, that's amazing. That's evaporative cooling is what that is. If I would take, I mean, we could have an object lesson. I could take this bottle or this glass of water. I could throw it in Brother Ryan's face, and he's sitting under that ceiling fan. In about two or three minutes, he's going to start getting a little chilly, right? But I'm not going to do that. Look, folks, you have to be blind to not notice these things. And it's not necessarily blindness. I'm going to show you what it is that makes people not able to notice these things. Last thing about water. Who's ever jumped into a lake? Where's the coldest water in a lake? Brother Ryan, where's the coldest water in a lake when you jump in? At the bottom. Okay? Something funny happens in a lake when it gets really cold. I'm from North Dakota. We go ice fishing. We drive on lakes and we drill a hole through the ice and we drop a line and we fish. The fish live in the frozen lake all winter long. Do you think the fish could live in a lake if the lake froze from the bottom up and they couldn't, see the, they couldn't get to the, the food on the bottom? Because most fish eat off the bottom, right? Something funny happens in a lake when it drops below 39 degrees and it heads towards freezing and we get what's called temperature inversion in the cold water comes to the top and the warm water goes to the bottom. I've always said that's proof of God, just that one thing right there. Because no, no marine life could live if lakes fro it just kept their temperature cold to hot. They would freeze from the bottom up and then we would never have any fish in cold climates. It's beautiful. You have to be blind to not notice it. Now, why don't people recognize this, right? You and I were sitting, I and mean, we could go on and on and on. We just talked about a glass of water. Why don't people recognize this? Well, the answer is in verse number 21. In verse number 21. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 21. And the Bible reads, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then in verse number 22, we see the real answer. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, you can see proof of this. It's, it's vanity. It's pride. Academia and science today has become filled with prideful, arrogant people. Right. And they do not acknowledge God, and God has turned them into fools.